late 80s, early 90s, resistance was the end of the world. The comments were throwaway comments, obviously, and we were only dealing with what we knew at the time. We have to sell our farms and do something else. At first, for growers, it's an enormous challenge and most growers that tackled the problem head on and, in, and implemented a lot of different uh, management strategies are winning the battle and they feel quite confident about their future of farming and confident that they're going to be able to manage resistant weeds into the future. At the time, was magical products coming through the system, they were just u beaut Clean was sensational, we spray it out and it worked, it was 100% control. It was expensive but it was a simple solution, it was out of a can, we could put in a boom spray and go for a drive and the problem was solved. What happened? Like anything, uh, human nature, if it's, if it's simple, it works, what do we do? We do it again, do it again, and we do it again, and very quickly, um, unbeknown to us, we discovered it stopped working. Long comes high grass. What do we do with that? We're a bit slow on the uptake, we're still learning, um, and uh, we use that, it's fantastic, just go and one spray, it's done. Again, again, and again, and we've got the same result. The label is, is obviously a rate that's chosen through research and the likes to give as close to 100% control as possible. There may be a bit of fat in that label, but at the, t at the same time, you're never always throwing under perfect conditions. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, I guess the industry as a whole, some more than others, took, took the opinion that um, we could halve the rate on a year in, year out basis, because wheat on wheat on wheat is quite profitable. Okay. We've sort of uh, multiplied the factor, and especially with ryegrass being an obligate outcrosser, mm -hmm. we've, we've accelerated it very quickly. And then we've lost our group A's, um, when I say group A's, we're talking going back to the, the FOPs, the high grasses and the likes, and then, then we go to the DIMS, and now I guess if we look at what we're doing today, if I go into a paddock of wheat or barley, I assume nothing works in crop. So I've got pre-emergent options, but I've got nothing in crop. I don't think the resistance and the, the densities are as bad in the southern region, um, and that would be ref a reflection on probably cropping frequency. Um, so. But having said that, it is becoming an issue, and I guess we're lucky in this respect, the north of WA versus the south, um, which is it's a big state, so it's a big generalisation, but we, we probably should be listening and learning with respect to what they've done in the north, and how can we sort of transpire that to the south, and obviously put a bit of time aside, and put some strategies in place. Where to, I guess looking back, what should have we done? We should have simply, which is a very strong message being used today, um, if you're on a good thing, don't stick to it which is, I think, um, an industry, industry throwaway line, which is very relevant, rotate your chemistry. Um, we're applicable, even though economics are the key thing, because financial, financial success is security, but use label rates, and don't, be, don't, don't, be, don't, think you can, don't think we're smart enough to do otherwise. And probably the other, other key take our message would be looking back, would be uh, simply uh, the solution cannot always be out of a drum. Farmers need to incorporate diversity in their control measures as soon as they can. Um, from burning windrows, uh, you know, swapping crops that they can to, to accumulate more weed seeds, and just use every technique that they can away from the boom spray to, to control weeds, and that will delay dramatically the, the development of resistance on their farms. I think probably the biggest issue we're looking at now, and I'm sure many guys would vouch for it, is, is radish. It's a different beast, it's obviously a weed, but the problem with radish is, I guess, really the, uh, the dormancy the staggered germination and we don't know what population we're dealing with. You travel to southern areas of the state and they say there's no radish here. It's quite an interesting comment then you sort of, that's what you hear. You, have, you observe and make your, own, make your own mind of it and then you actually start asking and talking and there's a lot more than, than people generally let you, let, let you know. But um, they're lucky down there. How, how did the radish get there? It's obviously been spread through, it's a hygiene issue. Um, I guess the, the classic would be stock feed. Be prepared to spend more money because the whole aim is to ensure 100% control. And when I say spend more money, it's not only in the cropping phase. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's, what we're doing is trying to do is control weeds, which is to give us an economic response to grow more produce, which in most respects is grain. Having a group B that's you know, working successfully for, for late radish control is something that most of the northern ag region doesn't have anymore. And it, it does close the window up for, for late weed control. So if you can protect that Group B chemistry, use it sparingly, except in that late scenario, um, it will give you that cheap option going forward for a long time. So, um, you know, a lot of paddocks don't have that available now and that just narrows the window of potential control measures. We've been in a privileged position now where we have a new chemistry, which is getting away from the Group I's, the Group B's. They're new, they're expensive, so they're potentially scary, but they're very effective. You don't have to use them over the whole program, just incorporate them into a small portion. 
what do you classify as small? Could be one paddock, could be two paddocks, could be a problem paddock, could be 20% of your farm. If you're 100% cropping, or alternatively uh, heading north of 75%, a lot of decisions we make, um, we have to take into consideration resistance. And uh, does that come at a cost? It does, because we obviously, in some respects, it's just a direct out cost with respect to a cheap five to ten dollar bread analog works. So I've got to go straight to twenty to thirty. That's just where we're at. Mm. Is that expensive? No, it's not because I'm going to control the weed, hopefully produce more grain, and then not only that, hit the numbers at a manageable level so I can, can extend the rotation further out with profitable crops in the enterprise. Most of the integrated weed management control measures don't cost a hell of a lot, so guys should incorporate them sooner rather than later. They are some are inconvenient, but guys just need to basically put them in as, as much as possible. The new herbicides are more expensive, hence the reason to, to use them sparingly on a, on a small part of your property. The main increase in cost of production in this part of the world has probably been the extra cost of broadleaf spray. A few years ago, probably 10 years ago, a lot of people were getting away with five or six dollars a hectare with a single broadleaf spray. Now it's two or three broadleaf sprays that can total 50 or 60 dollars a hectare. Still too many guys, in my view, guessing. How much money do we spend on herbicides? It's a lot. How many guys bother to go and do a test? Is it simply too expensive? A whole $350 per test to give you six, six, um, six results, six different chemicals? At least you're not stabbing and guessing in the dark and you can make a more informed decision. It may not be perfect information because we know there's, there's deficiencies with, with herbicide resistance tests because with radish in particular, are you dealing with this year's population or population from four years ago, but at least it's going to give you some, some guide and you can put some strategies in place. A result coming back with no resistance is fantastic. You can go and spend your $10, well, don't be too carried away, be prepared to spend 20 as a strategic to keep yourself in the loop and rotate your chemistry, but in some respects you can spend a lot less. From a grower's perspective, uh, probably the biggest conf cost is a confusion. Where are we at? Um, how much worse can it get? What, what, what can we implement and put, to put in place to try and manage it? And what are the best strategies? And then every, every strategy you do comes at a cost. I think given the suite of herbicides available now, it would be sensible to try and incorporate some of the newer generation products into the system earlier, just on you know 20 to maybe 30% of the farm, and use your conventional control measures on the rest, um, and just rotate that control measure around the farm to, to give that different group um, over the, the, the weed population that you're facing to, to give good control and not rely entirely on your Group I, Group B combinations. When growers tackle the problem head on and they take an aggressive approach to the weed management, they are generally winning the battle. So it's not doom and gloom, but it is a change in farming practices. But I think the positive is I think we're seeing some really good farming as a result of it and, and we've got really good farmers and they're doing a really good job of it. The key really is, is rotation and, and educated decisions and really the strongest message I would say is to know where you're at now and get the population tested. If, you, if you're on that first bit of the slope there's ways and means that you can really um, I guess lengthen the journey towards that peak resistance. If you are fortunate enough to not have any resistance to certain groups of chemistry in that paddock uh, then, then keep it that way. You know, don't therefore go and keep continue to use that group just because it's not resistance now, because all you'll do is develop resistance uh, down the track and you'll have another tool out of the toolbox. The thing is, if you're not sure, never continue on the path that you're going. Always put your hand up and ask either an advisor or consultant or a Bayer person um, for help or information if you're concerned about resistance developing and, you know, it's uh, maybe a couple of hundred dollars to get it tested. It's a pretty small investment in your farm and sustainability of all the groups and all the tools in your toolbox for the future.